I see that you have Hulk Hogan and Wendy Richter in your corner, Mr. Jones. Tell the viewers, Wendy, why you are supporting Mr. Jones for mayor. Because he's honest, unlike Mayor Phelps. You better believe it, dudette. And we've brought along some videotapes to prove it. What in tarnation so special about it, Captain Lou? You mean none of you guys remembered? Remember what, brother? Stop clowning around, Lou. We've got a lot of work to do. Some friends don't even remember a guy's birthday. Hogan's on his way. <laughs> I guess this isn't the public library, so how's about taking me to your boss? Hey, easy on the threads, dudes. Well, before you go, brother, we've got a little surprise for you. Bring her in. It's the Esoteric Roberts, Eric Roberts podcast. Tonight, we're talking about Facade from the good old year 1999. Woo! Roy, it's been a minute. Hello, hello. How's everything? Everything's good. Um, you know, last time and then maybe even the time before, I had kind of a poor microphone. I apologize to the audience for the quality on Hitman's Run and possibly Star 80. I bought this this um, microphone. It was on sale and I went to the Moore Target to get it on sale after seeing that they had one in stock online. And I went and I couldn't find it. And the employee there, he was a uh, small young man and he looked for me and he couldn't find it and told me that their website was having problems. That he said the Norman Target shows online that it has one too. And I asked him if he could call over to the Norman Target and ask them if it actually is in stock or if it's the website having problems. And he told me that their phone system was having problems. And at that point, I got uh, slightly indignant and said, so nothing works here. And I may have said it in a gruff voice. And he looked like I like someone had just murdered him or peed all over him. He looked scared as hell. And I realized that I'm a much larger man than him. And uh, I really frightened that guy and ruined his day. And I wanted to apologize to the people at the Moore Target, in particular him. I think he could have um, gone further. Uh, it's hard to find good help nowadays, and I think sometimes you gotta you gotta be a little mean if you want to get anything done in this world now. Man, he looked like a deer in the headlights. Like he was so scared. Like when I got mad, I only said that one thing. I didn't curse or anything. Plus, is hard. Yeah. <laughs> then I so I drove all the way to the Norman um, Target, which isn't really that far of a drive, and they had the microphone in question. Success. Well, it's been a few months since the last episode, Hitman's Run, also from 1999. Yeah. And you you had watched Facade not long after we selected that as the next episode. Yes. <laughs> I had not. I watched the first 10 minutes of Facade maybe four times since January. So I oh, fin wow. finally finished it today, as a matter of fact. I just kind of rewatched it uh, today as well. So we ought to both be pretty fresh on what happened in Facade. Probably I'm getting much fresher than any listeners will be. It's a film directed by Carl Kolpart. How would you pronounce the last name? I might call him Kolpair. Kolpair. He's a Belgian man. What do you know about this guy? He's an independent film producer that has an independent um, company called like Cineview or something like that. that Cineville? He, Cineville that he does with another guy. And they produced a lot of movies you've heard of, actually. Mm -hmm. And then he's directed and uh, a lot of movies you've never heard of. Yeah. One of those is the film Facade from 1999. <laughs> yes. Starring Eric Roberts. Yeah, he's the lead in this one. Huh? He doesn't get his name first in the credits because they go alphabetical. And it's an ensemble movie, but I think you could say he's the lead. Plot keywords, business partner betrays business partner. Plot keyword, dying during sex. And a new feature here at the Esoteric Roberts, Eric Roberts podcast, sartorial keywords. Do you have any sartorial keywords to add, Roy? Go ahead and list the ones that are written there. The one that actually was on IMDb's keywords was off-white necktie. Hmm, I wonder how that got there. <laughs> Yeah, I felt like maybe that was not just there on accident. No, but I, would, I had submitted it. And I would have accepted it. Nice work. I would have added ill-fitting suits, uh, sartorial yes. keyword suspenders. Yes, he had suspenders. Sartorial keyword Napoleon costume. 
Oh yeah. Nun's habit. Yeah. With a nip slip. Yeah, there is uh that does happen. So we have Eric Roberts in this movie looking very hirsute. Yes, you're right. <laughs> is this our first Roberts beard film? Good question. Man, it seems almost impossible that it could be. Let's think about this a moment. He didn't have a beard in Heaven's Prisoners or in Final Analysis or in, uh, what's the one, Specialist or Pope of Greenwich Village. He had a beard in the Odyssey. Oh, yes, that's right. And that was around this time. Oh, you're Maybe right. Yeah, A year or two around this time. But this is a movie that came out in 99, but it feels a little bit to me like it maybe languished for a while. It does it feel released. like that. Some things about maybe the way people, same way that Hitman's run, like how he's wearing the Jordans from 1997. Mm-hmm. And if I really think back to 99, it was more time when people would wear, we said that people would wear um, Jordans with dress clothes then, and they kind of would, but really that was a thing that would happen earlier. And that this was the time when people were wearing those shell Adidas's with everything. Mm-hmm. Yep. What, what made you think by, that it was, that it languished? Popularized by Fred Durst. <laughs> um, well, the, the look of it, it feels to me more like, like an indie American indie film from more of the mid nineties than the later nineties, but maybe the quality of the film itself, even yeah. the, the film stock, but it just yeah. had this vibe to me of, you know, that movie Schizopolis. It reminded me of that. It reminded me of early Hal Hartley. Oh yeah. But, uh, much worse than those movies. I'm not a huge Schizopolis fan but I would say it's a step above facade. This is our second really arty comedy after Coca-Cola Kid. Yes. Yeah, I was thinking a little bit about Coca-Cola. This is very I'm much in the this. same genre of Coca-Cola Kid. Mm-hmm. Irreverent. Just kind of strange. Very much like an art film, artsy comedy. Well, Lower budget. Not as good as Coca-Cola Kid, shockingly. A movie with a lot of ideas and no ideas at the same time. One strange idea is the movie opens with Rain Phoenix. Is it Rain? Yes. The prettiest of the Phoenix clan. Really, I kind of felt like uh, my first thought when the, she pops out, it starts with a kind of a cool shot of that trailer door, maybe the best shot in the whole movie. Mm -hmm. if, is that that uh, outside the trailer door just the composition and little signs on the door and stuff you see maybe that's when she shuts the door later or something like it looks pretty cool and she comes out i thought my first thought was that somebody put a wig on joaquin phoenix absolutely they look exactly like i, I don't know if i'd ever seen her before this oh really Had you yeah what do you know her from well she's in an, another movie that is a lot like this even cowgirls get the blues oh yeah i've never seen that yeah, that's, you know, a Gus Van Sant movie that's no one really talks about because yeah. it's really not that good. And it's based on a novel by Tom Robbins. Oh, yeah, I never read any Tom Robbins. He's kind of an irreverent writer in this style. Quirky, not great. The Gus Van Sant, I guess he really liked the Phoenixes, right? He worked with all of them. Yeah, he sure did. At least did. three. The three that are an entertainment. I was going to ask you about this opening because I couldn't figure out how it ties in with at all with the rest of the movie. <laughs> the movie is so ponderous and crazy that... <laughs> I really like, I got to the end of it the first time I watched it. I've seen the movie probably like at least three times now. Mm -hmm. At the end of the first of it, I was like, wait, did I miss where Rain Phoenix and Tracy Walter come back? And mm -hmm. no, it never ties in with anything. It has nothing to do with the rest of the movie that I can think of at all. It's like a weird modern spaghetti Western beginning set in a trailer park or something, it seems like. Mm hmm and it seems kind of cool. Like he starts off and you're like, hey, this might be a good movie or at least interesting. And like, yeah, it's like she comes out and somebody is like attacking the homestead of this trailer park trailer, like almost like uh, once upon a time in the West. But you don't see the attackers at all. You just see Tracy Walter maybe shot in the gut or something, die face down in a flower bed or something in front of her, her makeshift lawn and her scared and then we go to the opening credits but we never see shots fired or anything yeah i'm sure some big time facade fans out there are going to contact us and explain i think it might have been a joke maybe it was meant to tie in at some point i don't know this movie has such an odd sense of humor it's it is an absurdist film 
Mm -hmm. then maybe it's just that's a high-minded comedy idea yeah it's definitely a joke film like people will say speak in non sequiturs non-stop and just say absurd things and i think that this might have just been part of that have you ever seen godard's weekend no yeah it reminded me a lot of weekend which is a very irritating movie (laughs) <laughs> but i don't know i guess weekend has aged much well than than this so from there we jump to meeting this uh french character or who we think is a french character frederick fred oh yeah i wanted to point out a couple of things by the way yeah have that it. last episode i said that in a mark l lester's night of the running man starred kevin mccarthy but it was really andrew mccarthy <laughs> kevin mccarthy of course was the villain in uhf and he, <laughs> he did a lot of running but it was in the movie the old invasion of the body snatchers where he was the hero and then we also missed a funny name that the director of photography of hitman's run was zoltan david oh wow yeah, I yeah. think I remember seeing that. Okay. That's, that's worth that calling was, back to. Yeah, I think that was about it. Yeah, we have this guy, Frederick, who is a, he, he's a uh, builder of hotels. Robert the Bruce, Angus McFadden from Braveheart and the Robert the Bruce movie that came out a couple of years ago, which I tried to watch but couldn't get into. I just said, screw it. And then it's on Hulu if you want to watch the Robert the Bruce movie. And he's looking very much like, here's one thing that points to, maybe he just always looks like this, but that maybe it didn't languish, is that he looks very much like he could play Orson Welles, which he did in Cradle Will Rock, which is around from around 1999-2000. Interesting. How has he aged? Does he look good? You know, he's maybe gotten slightly plumper and he's old, older, like, but you can definitely still recognize him. He was in, the last thing I saw him in before this was in the movie, which is now like six years old or something, Lost City of Z, mm-hmm. the James Gray movie. He was oh, in yeah. that. Isn't he the unlikable? Yes. Yeah, he's pretty good in that. Yeah, that, that, and that's a kind of enjoyable movie. Like all James Gray movies, it's one that if you tell somebody you liked it and they go and watch it, they'll be like, that wasn't that good. But <laughs> in some weird way, they're all kind of good. True. Well, I have a theory that Scottish men age pretty well. So Hey, you're a Scottish man. Scottish American. I have some Scottish uh, blood in me. So let's <laughs> talk about this scene here. We have we have this um, hotel developer character. We have our... Uh, Friend of Angus the pod, yeah. Damien Chapa. Yes, as Raul Belliard. And what what's he doing in this scene? I have no idea. Is okay. he a Th- broker or or he's does he turn out to be a cop? He's a cop. He comes right? back as a police officer. L- I later, think maybe he's maybe he's a corrupt cop or something. Well, this scene is really what what um, prevented me from wanting to watch all of it. For months oh months. wow yeah this is a tough scene to get through and so they're talking about at this, this point you don't know how much hardcore nudity will be in it <laughs> true yeah you think there's going to be none really by the vibe of it all yeah persistence really pays off with facade 1999 yeah, it really does <laughs> so there's some discussion i don't really remember what they're talking about that the, the French guy's unhappy with the deal that's happening. And they're up in this, um, they're up in the hills in some kind of nice estate, it feels like. And then arrives Eric Roberts as Colin Wentworth, a businessman who has a business partner who doesn't want to play ball with this deal. And the partner um, is, we don't meet him yet. Is it Tom O'Brien as Bob Kellner? Or no, it's T- Joseph Arsenault as Tom? It's Bob, so it would be Tom oh. O'Brien, who I didn't recognize, but he does no. look like maybe he he's looks, been in some stuff. He's been in a lot of stuff, it seems like. 51 things. He was most recently in the movie Chappaquiddick as the neighbor's husband. Is uh, Damien Chappa in Chappaquiddick? <laughs> no, they don't let Damien Chappa in real movies anymore. He's too busy making his awesome independent films. You know, Roy, I had a great idea. If you ever wanted to branch out and, and have another podcast, it, you could do a Damien Chappa podcast. Hmm. I feel you know, like there's I think a lot you, of chopaholics out there who would be you interested. mentioned this idea on a podcast about Hitman's Run. <laughs> Really, I'm repeating myself. Yes, I just wanted to bust out the uh, the chopaholics. Chopaholics, chop shop. So the only other thing I have to add about that scene is um, that there was a strange plate of fruit 
that maybe had it could chili be called, peppers on it. Maybe it could be called chop a quit it. Chop a quit it. Chop, why don't you chop and knock maker, it off? Stop them making the movies. <laughs> yeah, it's just a, a podcast about you trying to get people to sign a petition. Well, we're, I'm looking at this fruit with chilies thing because there is, you can keep going and I'll, I'll look at this fruit chili thing. Well, there's, so the French guy has, I guess what you would call a landscape lady with a, does she have the machete in this scene she's doing mm. some landscaping around the hills. maybe she does do it with the um the landscaping she's a little i don't know how would you describe this character she's a little pistol right a little pistol yeah she's a she's a mexican house cleaner lady who also seems like she might be a companionship person but we're mm-hmm. not sure exactly she's definitely more intimate than your more intimate with the hero with uh, the frenchman colbert yeah maybe they're trying to tie in the chili peppers with her which i did you find out that the director's name is colbert and that the uh french guy's name is colbert i did make that connection what do you think about it i don't know it's on this lady that plays juanita she's patricia velasquez and i guess she was on stuff magazine's 2200 hottest women list somewhere and she was uh, a venezuelan model who i think is in the mummy and the mummy returns maybe as a lady mummy so she's playing uh, an arab perhaps? yeah and an she Egyptian? wrote a book i know you read it it's called straight walk and in the book she comes out of the closet as a lesbian she wrote that yeah that's her autobiography it's one of my favorite books i know that reminds me funnily enough one of my favorite films is straight talk (laughs) starring (laughs) dolly parton who's not in facade yeah we get to meet this business partner guy who you said is played by tom o'brien and uh he's very unlikable douche when we first see him a bird poops on his suit oh wow i forgot that he goes upstairs and then pulls a shotgun out of somewhere in his office and begins shooting out the window at the bird. I thought he was shooting people on the beach. I guess he's <laughs> shooting at the bird. <laughs> yeah, he was shooting at the bird. Now, did you notice in their office, there's a piece of fruit and a green apple? I missed it. Yeah, on the one of their like black planning board or planning board or something, there's on the wall there's a green apple much as with the businessman in magritte it's painting Mm -hmm. and that's why when you said the i would look into this fruit and chili thing i hadn't come up with any because there is a theme in this absurdist movie to tie into the paintings of magritte and the art of magritte okay this is our first first uh look at that i believe in this scene you know, another I was film, like, hmm, businessmen and a green apple. That reminds me of something. Another film that did that, Toys. Oh, yes. The Greek yeah, references. Which had already toys. come out. So this is an apple, a picture or a painting of an apple on the wall? No, there's, is, there's just an apple. Okay. Yeah, I missed that. So and in this, this is the, where we also have Roberts is wearing boots in this scene. Yeah, I did. I did see that sartorial keyword, strange boots with a suit. And their computer has no monitor. Miss that. But there are a lot of strange visual choices meant to uh, unsettle you that I noticed throughout the film. It's a movie that you never get comfortable with when you watch it. It's full of choices, like kind of in the David Lynch vein of like, let's just kind of like remove something or add something to make it strange, but done in such just a dumb headed way. (laughs) Did you know that Robert Miano, your favorite character and actor from uh, Hitman's Run, who is the mob boss, and he was also briefly in the movie Lansky that will have been our hiatus here, a brief hiatus. He, I watched him in an episode of Crime Story Season 2, and his wife in the episode is misidentified in two different YouTube comments as Beverly D'Angelo, who was in Lansky <laughs> with Robert Miano. And it was really Andrea Thompson playing his wife. She just Damn. looks kind of like Beverly D'Angelo. And people are like, whoa, check out young Beverly D'Angelo post-vacation. Yeah. It kind of makes the head spin, doesn't it? Yes. Hey, I've been watching Frasier. Remember we talked about Eric Roberts right around this time. Oh, yeah. I was in an episode of Frasier as one of the call-in guys, as is the, um, the style of the show. And what happens at the end of every season of Frasier is they finally reveal who were all the call-ins. Oh, so, really? 
on the season finale of this of the season that Roberts was on, it was showing pictures of all the actors, and there was Roberts. Also, during that season or the season before, Mercedes Rule was one of the main characters in that season of Frasier. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, Roy, have you ever seen Mercedes Rule and Eric Roberts in the same place at the same time? <laughs> no. There's a bit of a resemblance. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> I didn't think of that. I really like Mercedes Rule. I miss her. What happened to her? I don't know. I just think she's uh, not acting that much. I haven't seen her in anything in a while. Good question. She's probably uh, uh, 70. She's in that getting up there in years. Maybe not interested in it. Yeah, maybe their parts dried up. So back to the plot, what there is of the plot. It seems like this uh, Bob character who is Eric She's Roberts been being on a TV partner. show called Bull in three episodes. Mercedes? Yeah, that's now seems wrapped up. And she was a character named Judge Tessa Hudson. And she was on, she, she seems like she's just pops up in guest spots on TV. Okay. She's still around. Yeah. Nothing in 2021. She's pretty great in The Fisher King. Yes. Was she nominated for an Oscar for The Fisher King? I believe she was. I believe so. Did she win? I think she might have won. Well, that's a good question. I'll look it up right now. She did win. Nice. Oscar winner Mercedes Rule, um, a.k.a. Eric Roberts. Maybe so that's the big story. For an Oscar for Runaway Train. Yeah, Roberts couldn't win as a man. This is kind of a Tootsie plot yeah, line now. A kind of a Soul Man story. <laughs> yes. A co-worker of mine really loves that movie Soul Man and brings it up a lot. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of his favorite movies. So do you remember what happens in this office scene? It's, it's Roberts trying to smooth his business partner over. I think this is the first time we find out that Roberts, his business partner, is married to a former enamorata of Roberts. Oh, yeah, and that's that right. he knows Roberts maybe still carries a flame for her. Forgot all torch. about this. Well, somewhere yeah. in here, um, Roberts is keeping in touch with Colbert, and they pretty much, and this is mentioned in the scene before this, like they're ready to take out the business partner okay, so that they can proceed with this building, this hotel, because he's standing in their way. So Colbert hires Joe Vitarelli and Brad Garrett, who play hitmen in this movie. Yeah, and this is our third out of four movies with hitmen in them. And our sec uh, third Vitarelli? Yeah, our third Vitarelli movie. And I was thinking about this is when you were saying that he was in um, Scorsese movies. I was thinking maybe you think he looks like, and he does resemble somewhat, the guy who plays Remo, the main bomb boss in Casino. That like, you know, he's like the guy that, uh, you know, the main mob boss you see a lot in Casino. And I was thinking, who the heck is that guy? Because I don't really recognize that guy from anything. The guy that plays Remo, he's like the less famous than Joe Vitarelli. And so his name is Pasquale Cajano. And he was an Italian language radio guy in New York who knew Scorsese's family. And Casino was his first speaking part in a movie. And I guess uh, he previously maybe been like a very small non-speaking part in Age of Innocence. Very cool. Yeah. I'd have to see him to see if I recognize him. I haven't seen Casino in a long time. That's a tough one to, for me to watch. It's been playing a lot on Paramount Network, but with heavy editing and commercials. Mm, there's a lot of Chinese dentist in it. Yeah. <laughs> the next scene i believe there's so we get into some female scenes here which i sorry ladies i tuned out a bit during these scenes i wasn't paying that close attention to these but we get introduced to the wife caroline yes and she goes to a place called sassafras nursery <laughs> okay where she meets up with uh, her friend is it chloe and mm, another lady. Chloe is the nun, right? Oh, this was the big thing in this movie. There are a lot of like female characters all seemingly played by models, it feels like. Oh, yeah. And and they all kind of become interchangeable with the exception of Rain Phoenix. And it's confusing who is who. But there are three blonde ladies in this scene. Mm -hmm. And one of them is maybe two of them are partners, maybe not. And one of them is, uh, well, let's, let's look at this list of people in the movie. So Caroline Kellner is the main lady who is the wife. And then there's, yeah, maybe Dawn Eason next Chloe is the nun we meet later. So these ladies are Connie and 
maybe Kate or something. Yeah, Caitlin Dulani, who's had many a TV episode. Yeah, so there are two ladies here, and they talk a lot about one of them's like really into speaking anti-feminist stuff or something about how women aren't supposed to be in business and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And she hangs out at this place where they drink Arrowhead water and Bud Light, the Sassafras Nursery. Oh, yeah. How'd you like those vintage Bud Light cans? Yeah, that was pretty cool. Well, this scene was giving me a big Godard feeling of, as David Mamet says, French movies are movies where people think a lot out loud, where just a lot of listless uh, musing is going on as they're walking around this sassafras place. Oh, yeah. Caroline is played by Camilla Overby Roos. Whoa. That's a weird name. Overby, I, I guess, is the one of the names. <laughs> One of their of her names. Overbite. Uh, according to IMDb, she hasn't been in a film since 2012. So her career's career's been over by since 2012. Caroline Kellner. Yeah. So once we grind through that scene, that well, slog this is also, of isn't this do we have to come back to them before we find out like that the one the girl that's like really saying the anti-feminist stuff, the younger of the two, three blonde ladies, she tells caroline that her husband's probably cheating on her and so caroline calls home to talk to her husband and maybe she i think she does talk to him but we see that he's in bed with a uh another blonde lady mm-hmm. with very yeah, big mistress. boobs and she looks like a soft core queen yes <laughs> and uh the i guess um she hangs up he, he plays it off like it's not obvious he's with a woman. He answers the phone and everything. But as soon as she hangs up, the young girl's like, oh, you're dead in the water. She knows that there's something going on. Mm-hmm. Next thing that we see would be Brad Garrett and Joe Vitarelli traveling to their to complete their assignment. They're in a convertible of some yeah. sort and having a very Pulp Fiction-y kind of conversation about women, their wives or something. Joe Vitarelli's having marriage trouble and brad garrett's talking to him about women yeah and about how like if you reveal your your softnesses to your woman you're dead in the water she'll leave you i guess somebody wanted to be an actor in it also he says never talk about your passions in front of your lady she that's what he's give talking a about shit. yeah yeah she doesn't give a <laughs> shit yeah it's a nice piece of advice yeah <laughs> did you find their uh, musings on women to be at all correct well, I listened to them a lot closer than I did the ladies in the scene before. I don't know what that says about me. So I think sometimes it feels like there's some truth to there's some, what they were saying. That's what's frustrating about this movie is that there are every now and then there is a nice insight where you're like, whoa, some actual intelligence is shining through. On the way to their destination, they are stopped by what appears, appears to be a police officer who <laughs> tells them tells them some crazy shit roy yeah. do you remember what he says <laughs> yeah kind of go ahead <laughs> well i'm trying to recall he, he basically says them, that okay there's some kind of challenge and there's only going to be one man left standing and then he tells them not to impregnate a woman whose name i can't remember yeah, he says the winner of the, the the winner of the challenge, the last man left alive, will be uh, able to impregnate Belinda. Belinda, there you go. Be able, yeah, he tells him to impregnate Belinda or be able to impregnate Belinda. You're right. So well, maybe he warns them not to if they win. I don't remember. No, I think he they, tells them to that they're going to, and then they're like, whoa, and drive off. And not long after, they run into a van that's being driven by some mental hospital orderlies. Yes. And the main orderly, he seemed pretty familiar. Lee yes. Arenberg, he's been in a bunch of stuff. Yes. Uh, what do we most, know him from? Well, most recognizably from the film 25th Hour as one of the police officers who is just like, remember the scene in that movie when Edward Norton is being interrogated? It's a flashback to when he first got busted for uh, possession. Oh, yeah. And there's a hilarious cop in the background he was like doing weird shit with his oh mouth. you're right that's him Man, that's our I did boy not make that connection holy smokes yeah that's one of the weirdest scenes that could, that could almost be something in this movie that's our boy lee ehrenberg yeah who really knows how to chew scenery quite literally <laughs> that was crazy so he's pretty see, decent uh, in this what year he would 25th them, hour be from 
2001 or something man maybe roy i'm not seeing this in his credits maybe it's a lookalike. uh joseph arsenault this says that we mostly recognize him as a pirate and pirate of the caribbean or not joseph arsenault but lee Ehrenberg. we mostly know him as a pirate you know um, what I, I stand corrected i don't think he was that guy but man i'm telling you those guys look quite a lot alike yeah in my head when you say it i kind of picture a different guy oh, looks boy. like he was in another tales from the crypt we've had a lot of actors who appeared on tales from the crypt oh he's got a total tales from the crypt way about him he's been in a lot of different star trek series he kind of <laughs> has that star trek stock as well like maybe they put some makeup on him he's in a couple episodes of seinfeld all right so this guy's got a nice oh you know who he is i know what i know him from in fact i know multiple things i know him from okay he's the guy in the seinfeld who is like george who gets in the fight with par- george and tries to get a parking space outside jerry's apartment and he's <clears throat> trying to parallel park and he tries to go in like back first and there's another guy trying to go in head first or vice versa and he's the guy lee Ehrenberg's the guy He's also the guy who ushers in uh, or is taking signups for the big video game Armageddon tournament in the movie The Wizard. <laughs> yeah, okay. I definitely remember that character. Yeah, who's way too enthusiastic. But yeah, Seinfeld is really what I recognize him from, I think, mostly, is that, is that he does play a very memorable Seinfeld character. He's pretty good in this little moment here. In this yeah, movie. he's fine. Yeah, he's he and Joe Vitarelli, <clears throat> once again, are probably some of the best part. Yeah, I don't even need to mention that Vitarelli is smoking a lot of cigarettes. Oh, yeah, he like, really is. With the classic dangling out of his mouth, all slovenly. He likes to do that. Um, what a great role for Tracy Walter, by the way. No <laughs> I lines. I didn't even remember. I didn't he, even, I don't even think I recognized him as that guy. He's so recognizable to me that I don't even think you see his face. I think he just lays straight down in the mud. And I was like, is that Tracy Walter? And then when they do the opening credits where they tell you everybody's name in the movie in alphabetical order, his name's in there. And I was like, I guess mm-hmm. it was Tracy Walter. And I thought, I always thought we were going to get like a flashback thing and see him. But no, he never comes back. He just lays face down in the mud. When they run into these mental hospital guys, they're looking for the cop who's not really a cop. He is an escaped mental hospital patient who was an actor who played a cop in a TV show that was canceled. So he's still trapped in this show. It makes you wonder what the hell that show is about. Yeah, and they asked it. He asked them <laughs> if, uh, or if he told them there was something about it impregnating Belinda. And they say yes. And he says, don't do it, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Which is pretty good, wacky. Very kind of wacky. Funny. So from there, we go to Roberts's character's house, which is uh, unsettling. It's covered in painting paper. Yeah. Talk about your liminal spaces. This was another movie that until like maybe the very final scene of the film is just constantly in like Canyon roads and yeah. hilltops and a, a bizarre mansions dream. where nobody's around. It's it's really a Euro guy's dream of what California is. It's, it's there's a lot me, of it weird. It almost felt like Colbert like filmed at his house and other people he knows houses. Yeah. Was definitely definitely, a vibe. Oh, definitely had that feeling there's a lot of weird patios and pools and stuff like that in this a nun shows up to roberts's house holding a collection can what happens he offers her some wine they drink some wine they start talking about forgiveness i can't yeah. remember if it's revealed i guess it has already been revealed that roberts is in on the murder stuff yeah he, he well, obviously yeah, so knows have we seen happen. the murder stuff go to, oh yeah 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 like she i don't yeah i guess we know that He's in on this hitman thing, I guess. Yeah. So he's like, it seems like he has a little bit of guilt, but not a lot. Yeah. This is this movie never really um, has any kind of emotion. I don't think he has any guilt yet because he wants to talk thing... about forgiveness here. Oh, you're right. And he's very into that idea. And uh, we, I guess we should point out this nun woman is another very attractive blonde lady. Mm-hmm. This movie I just seems a like it's Rain Phoenix and a bunch of models are all the female characters. That's what they should have titled it. Yeah. Oh yeah, she's wearing a corset. Yeah, she's very, uh, very sexy nun. I feel like intercut between him and the nun talking, we go back to the hitmen who are outside. They go in the house of the people. 
mm-hmm. right, of the, the business partner, and they leave tracks in the mud outside, like all great hitmen do. I was thinking the best hitmen, though, leave Air Jordan tracks. Right. Yes. Good call. They go, go in, in there. The guy's uh, making love to his mistress. Old, yeah. Old Bob. There is a shotgun pulled on him. What did the guy say? He sees the two hitmen, and there's some wisecrack. Do they, they say, say like their neighbors? Their neighbors there for sugar or something? Or yeah. Ketchup or something like that. Can we borrow some ketchup, maybe? Yeah. Can we borrow some ketchup? The shotgun is not loaded. So we cut away to the outside of the of the this uh, place where the guy's boning his mistress, and we hear gunshots, but we don't know who shot who. Doesn't quite doesn't really sound like a shotgun blast. But what do I know about yeah. cheap movie sound effects? Yeah, this movie repeatedly is too cheap to show us guns going off, or maybe that was a thing it was trying to do. Yeah, it shies away from violence pretty much throughout the whole thing. Next day, we were back at Eric Roberts's liminal home and the nun is now like using his bathtub yeah she's timing how long she can hold her breath in the bubble bath yeah he's and brushing he's practicing his teeth his remorse and shock at the call from the police saying that his partner's dead or from somebody mm-hmm. and he gets the call he goes to the crime scene where he meets uh damien choppa is back now as the police yes. officer which is i don't know i could i could never figure that out and he's with and he's partnered with real spike lee regular unlike your fake spike lee regular mm-hmm. roger guinevere smith mm-hmm. who we recognize from especially from um do the right thing as the mentally smiley. challenged guy smiley and then but he uh, also is in malcolm x and he got game and he's really so we, i like him and get on the bus oh yeah yeah he was the villain in the first episode of eagle heart <laughs> the sky pirates no the first one is the one where he shoots the villain but the villain doesn't die and becomes mentally challenged and he nurses him back to sell health and then kill gets him and kills him vaguely remember that it's called like get worse soon or something like that <laughs> so eric roberts goes he's at the crime scene and he goes up to roger Gu- roger guinevere smith and he says something like i knew a black guy once and he's like his name was such and such do you- uh, you might know him. Remember this scene? Yes. Pretty and strange. Guinevere Smith immediately complains to Damien Chapa that Eric Roberts is one of those guys that thinks all black people know each other. Mm-hmm. And he's going to tell him something about black people that'll blow his mind and blow the whole world's mind. And then he starts talking, but a plane flies overhead, which is a recurring. This becomes a, a, a motif in the movie, a plane going overhead. And, and we hear the plane and we don't hear anything he says as he speaks passionately or impassioned. And then Damien, once the plane clears and he's done talking, Damien Chop is like, wow, I wish everybody on earth could hear that, man. What do you think about that? I didn't care for it. Didn't really work. You know, we did. We missed though. We did miss the maybe the first uh, joke that really landed with me, and maybe one of the only ones, if maybe the only one, is like that before Eric Roberts goes to the crime scene, the wife shows up to the crime scene and finds the dead bodies of her husband and his mistress, therefore confirming her friend's suspicions that she put in her head. Oh, that's right. It. And she p- sees the mistress and she pulls down the, the covers and puts her hand on the mistress's boob and says, fake. Yeah. And I thought that was pretty funny. And then we get when um she's still there when Roberts shows up at the house and the police are there and she and Roberts are very chummy. And mm-hmm. this sets Guinevere Smith's radar off. And he thinks he, he immediately suspects that Roberts might be in, 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 on, in, it. in, in on it. Yeah. And Roberts says something crazy like, hey, man, this is just a rumor and I spread them like I hear them. But is it true that in LAPD, there's a department within the department? So maybe that's how he sets up the the black thing. Maybe not. Maybe there's another non sequitur. Yeah, he he talks about police misconduct too in that scene, in that moment of that scene. A lot of this, uh, like the stuff with the plane flying overhead, it reminded me of another Roberts film, Inherent Vice. It had a lot of zany ideas and ideas that were actually um, drawn from a very inspired novel, but the gags just did not land. Maybe this is actually our third artsy comedy then you're right because they're inherent vice is very much an artsy comedy yeah yeah we missed that one 
because it does belong yeah, in that you're right that was the that's probably the best of the three that we've Artsy done comedy perhaps the one of the uh, a genre that's the easiest to fuck up yeah maybe comedy in general mm-hmm. yeah, this was pretty bad there's some more phone conversation with colbert you remember this there's some more stuff with the oh yeah the hispanic they the... machete lady yeah and she's kind of always kind of undercutting colbert but she's also around and colbert is always just talking about how great france is so yeah. we, when they talk about him later they call him colbert but I just assumed because he was so French, his name was Colbert. But I guess he's now they're going to put phase two into action, which is to kill uh, the wife because now they can get her out of the deal. And she's going to be spending the night at Roberts's house or something like that. And Roberts is like, that's not going to look fishy at all. The police that she gets killed the next day at my house. And they already suspect me. And so he tries to put a hold on them doing this. This is where I, I get confused. Is I mean, I guess he obviously uh, wants them to do it. He does. This is where he's more, he's way conflict. He doesn't really want them to do it, but he also wants the deal to go through. He's conflicted about this because he also tries to convince them later that he can convince her not to do it because he goes inside at his house and she's topless, right? And maybe this is later, but she's like topless in his house. This is the one time in the movie we don't see any nudity, really. We just see her back. And then mm-hmm. she tells him to get naked and he does. And this is why we do get topless Roberts again, which uh, and when this time in our body challenge, I was eating Swedish fish jelly beans. <laughs> yeah, I was eating. I was eating during this movie, some chicken nuggets. Nice. <laughs> so let's talk. Let's uh, talk about the Roberts body challenge. How's it going okay. for you? I am. uh I thought I had, I lost weight, I thought, but I didn't weigh myself. I started at 205, then I gained all the weight back because of Easter happened. And then I've been staying with my parents for an extended period. And when my mom, my mom went on a trip, it was just my dad and I, and my dad doesn't really cook. And I don't cook when my dad's here or really cook at my parents' house. And so we just ate takeout constantly and I gained yeah. all the weight back. And then uh, I think I'm, I think now or whatever I'd lost, I gained back. And I was at 205, but now I'm back down to 200, I believe. Okay. So not great is the answer. I've made a little progress, but not great. I was hoping to report no progress at all, but I couldn't honestly do that. I did make a little progress. How about you? Roy, I got to tell you, my body is looking exactly like Eric Roberts is now. <laughs> well, I could probably make some progress in the eating department, but I have been exercising a ton. I've been back. You and I are routine. so much the same. I've been exercising, but not eating healthy. It's, it's hard to get the food part down. But I'm also, I like to drink, you know, and so I'm trying to just not do that during the week and kind of not go too hard on the weekend, just kind of have casual drinks. And so that helps because booze uh, has a lot of calories in it, but I do feel like I'm doing, I I look a little bit better naked, Good. which is really the, isn't that the ultimate goal? (laughs) I don't care how long I live. The goal is to look like Eric Roberts for one day of your life. Well, he's got some pretty nice, flowy, feathery hair in this one. How would you rate his hairstyle in this? Yeah, he looks great. His suits just do not look good on him. No, they're they're wacky. They're not as cool as his hitman's run suit. Yeah, maybe they're just a little too in that mid ninety, mid to late nineties. Everything was a little bit baggier vibe. But I never really think that. How do you feel about suspenders? They sometimes look really good, but I don't feel like anybody should actually wear them. Yeah, in le- I think unless you're a big fat guy. Yeah, they come into style sense. for a day or two every once in a while, and they they do. I think they look cool in a weird way but like I would never recommend them. Yeah. Maybe at a wedding, like if you had, let's say that you were getting married and I was invited to be a groomsman, would you want your groomsmen to be uh, guys that wore suspenders? Hmm. Unsure. We were at a wedding once where the groomsmen and stuff had to wear um, Guy Bear shirts. Mm -hmm. That might be more my speed. I think the last big, um, one of the last big groomsmen weddings I attended, I wore a vest which you can't really do that with suspenders. So really, why not? It's just going to cover it up. Part oh, of the yeah. suspenders is you kind of want, want to show to them see off. Him. Oh, now I, I could, see. I'm not a big menswear kind of, I don't, 
have a lot of knowledge of that. Maybe that is a thing. Maybe people wear suspenders beneath a vest. It seems a little yeah, crazy. Not? Like it'd be uncomfortable. I'm not a big vest person. Me neither. But at a wedding, maybe so. Mm-hmm. I think I had a vest. At the, I, I think that, the, you know, another weird item of clothing is the cummerbund. Yes. I would rather wear a vest than a cummerbund. Me too. That's why my brother's wedding was the last one I was at. And I wore a cummerbund. No, a vest as a groomsman in that. And I was happy that it was not a cummerbund. During this scene where... Roberts is hooking up with Caroline. There's a flashback to Roberts and Bob when they were younger, I guess. Remember the scene? They drive by a homeless man. He's he's talking to the wife, right? Mm -hmm. And he tells her a story about he and Bob with the homeless man. (laughs) Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. (laughs) Eric Roberts gives him some Cuban cigars that he dumps onto the road and they drive away. Yeah, who played the bump? They give the they give a homeless man a, a bunch of uh, cigars. Mm-hmm. And looking at this list of people in the movie, I don't see even uncredited as a bum. Did it look like Dean Cameron to you? No, uh, I don't remember. I didn't get a great look at him. You don't maybe I mean he's got you see him better than you see Tracy Walter, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. But you don't he's you know he's filthy and dressed crazy and stuff and you don't see him forever but it looked like dean cameron to me but i can't imagine it probably wasn't dean cameron but it looked like him and yeah the bum gets ran over as he's leaning over to pick up the cigars and they look in the rear view and are laughing i did notice that roberts well maybe it's bob is wearing a strange piece of late 90s fashion which this kind of confuses the time period in which this movie was shot because i don't remember seeing these polos with a v-neck oh yeah those were very popular they they were like an old navy staple for a few years and i don't remember seeing those until around 98 maybe 97 at the earliest i mean we also in this we were already past it but at some point roberts has an earring in the movie as well yeah and i think he has the line where he says to somebody at his house May casa is su casa, and he attributes it to who? Who does he say is the originator of that saying? I can't remember. Val Kilmer. Oh, I don't remember that that at all. Yeah, there's also some weird audio mix going on in this movie. Has uh, Roberts and Kilmer been together in a film? Man, it's hard to believe they haven't with as many director videos as they've done. Let's think about this. I, I can't think of one. Yeah, I can't think of one off the top of my head. We go from this scene to Bob's funeral, where Caroline goes to see the body. Oh, yeah. First, we go to the funeral home. You're right. Yeah, maybe it's more of the viewing Mm -hmm. at the funeral home. And there, it's a strange upright coffin. It's It's a a very crazy coffin. Leaned up and... uh, and It's the definitely the actor in there, and he has a big grin on his face. There was another, this is another thing that made me look into this, is that this coffin is from a Magritte painting. Okay, another and there reference. Was a, there was an apple, I think, on the, there might have been a green apple on the coffin in the movie. Remember at the end of the think, scene, something falls. I think it might be that. The apple? Uh, or maybe the guy's sushi. It was something the, a little bit heavier. Okay, it might have been the apple. Yeah, the but this coffin thing is probably the other thing in the movie I liked was the, how crazy this coffin is. And I was like, I liked this scene. Yeah. Like the, the, where the, yeah, this was probably the best, maybe the best scene in the movie other than to me when she puts her hand on the lady's boob and says it's fake. She's now disgusted. I don't remember. I don't remember if this scene is all one shot, but it felt like a lot of it was. Yeah. This funeral home worker comes in and he's a kind of recognizable dude. John Tolls Ray. John Tolls Bay, and he's been in a bunch of stuff. He, much like uh, Lee Arenberg, was in Waterworld. He's one of the soldiers in that movie Cadence with Charlie Sheen. Oh, yeah, I remember that movie. He was in the classic film Larry uh, David's directorial debut, Sour Grapes. <laughs> okay. Which is terrible. And he's in a, right. oh, you know what? He's he's one of the killers <laughs> in the movie A Rage in Harlem. Have you ever seen A Rage in Harlem directed by Bill Duke? I haven't. I recommend it. Yeah, I think you have recommended it to me before. Nice. You don't remember recommending that to me? No. God damn. But anyway, this guy, he's eating sushi. 
Yeah, he's a black Bullshit. man, and he says that the air conditioning is off upstairs and it's cool down there. Yeah, so he has his sushi down there. Do you there. mind if I eat my sushi down here and it's on a plate and he's just eating it right over by the body? And, and he, then starts he starts yelling, yelling at the body. Yeah, for being unfaithful. <laughs> yeah, I like this scene a lot. And just knowing that that guy's in there having to stay frozen with that <laughs> smile. Yeah, because you know they didn't have a dummy of him. It's definitely the guy. He does a good job, you know, those these kind of scenes in movies like that, especially when I was younger, I'm always watching to see if someone flinches or there's some kind of movement, breathing movement, you know, when someone's playing a corpse. Yeah, the craziest corpse playing, right, is like Radio Rahim in Do the Right Thing, the late Bill Nunn. He has to lay there for a minute, right? Yeah, without moving it at all. And like his like head's right in the like a wide angle shot or something. Yeah. His eyes open. So we move from that scene to the actual funeral which is poolside at, at another nice estate somewhere in la yeah this well the, yeah like a lot Looks of stuff like in this movie um it seems like it's la like the, the the office of eric roberts and bob was definitely in la but there's also a big thing in this of like going up around um santa barbara montecito kind of way i feel like okay well they do and yeah so there's never a really lot of hills sure yeah which is also la a lot of hills in la but there's yeah a lot of talk about at some points i think they're up in like yeah santa barbara montecito and stuff which is another thing about this colpair guy i watched did you watch any other colpair movies no i i did not uh prepare i was i was ill colpaired he, he made one in 2000 and like 2021 called something about her that all takes place more or less at a mansion in in santa barbara that i watched well when i say it all takes place there and i watched it all of it i watched took place at this mansion because i turned the movie off at some point because it was too boring and it didn't have it had a briefly anthony michael hall in it it didn't have the all of the recognizable people like this movie. And I watched another movie that he made before this called The Crew. Not the movie The Crew by Michael Dinner, which would have come out after this with Burt Reynolds and Richard about Dreyfuss. But he made the another man. Yeah, this movie was about it was a uh, took place in Florida and it starred Donald Logue and Vigo Mortensen as buddies and they go out on Vigo Mortensen's boat with Donald Logue's wife after his mom Grace Zabriskie dies in the beginning it's another weird movie the crew is really weird yeah like looking, this movie I I vaguely remember this being on maybe IFC or oh, one of the crazy. Weird cable channels back in the later 90s early thous because I oh, remember a movie with Donald Logue and Jeremy Sisto yes and Jeremy Sisto plays a trans person who's transitioning and it's Jeremy Sisto with fake boobs and he jacks their boat and they get into like a crazy standoff, like in dead calm or something, which I've never seen or knife in Whoa. the water or something. Jeremy's sister. Yeah. And it comes out that Donald Logue's wife is cheating on him with this like spin doctors -y looking rock and roll guy. <laughs> and yeah. I'm looking at it. He looks like the dude from Alice in Chains might very well be that guy. <laughs> Vigo Mortensen is Lane like smuggling Staley. a bunch of movie. Is it Lane Staley? The guy has that look. I don't believe it's him, but he's yeah. got the, the chin goat and the those crazy sunglasses. It was another very bad movie. But if you look on Colin Culpair's IMDb, where it talks about him, his like biography, and it talks about that Cineville thing, they say they made the movies that broke out independent films that were like breakout roles for a bunch of people. And it claims the crew is the breakout of Vigo Mortensen. Hmm. Does anybody know Vigo Mortensen from the crew? Wasn't he already in Carlito's Way? And uh, what's the his real breakout role is probably the Indian Runner. Yeah, see, I, I don't, I wasn't I a big trying Carlito's to take Way guy. I didn't watch that until later. So yeah, but there's. I just thing, remember I seeing him in in Lord of the Rings and being like, I don't really recognize this guy. Oh, crazy! Well, I think before Lord of the Rings, he got a lot of press for GI Jane. But he's like the he's the main he and uh, David Morse are the main guys and Sean Penn's the Indian runner. And I think that really like brought him to a lot of people's attention because then when could when they did Carlito's Way, I think Vigo Mortensen's name's even on the poster. And like when the in the trailers for Carlito's Way, they would say Vigo Mortensen, even though he's only in one scene of the movie. Hmm. Okay. 
Ben Vigo Mortensen's in a bunch of stuff before the crew. Like he's in Young Guns too. And I think he just kind of kept plugging away on the edges of public consciousness. He plays the devil in the movie Prophecy, which would be after the crew. But yeah, I think to call the crew his breakout role would be pretty crazy. Sounds like the the work of Colbert. Yeah, yeah. Back to the plot of Facade, Roy, which is important. You're right. Well, I wanted to talk about this funeral scene because did you, could you identify the priest who is presiding over the funeral? No, could you? I looked him up and he's like, not from anything. Is he, is he from something else? Is he listed, even listed in the cast? I believe so. I couldn't find him. Because I found him at some point. I think he's maybe listed under his character's name or something. I thought it would be father something or other, but no, I, I couldn't I couldn't figure out who play what was the name of the priest, you know? Can't remember now. His there's a character in this named apparently in the movie named uh, Tom. And there's a character named Kyle, whom we haven't come across in any way. I'm going to look up Tom. Well, while you're Joseph. looking that up, I'll explain. I think I looked this up. I think this is, I think the guy, no, Tom is the, is the other uh, soldier we haven't met yet. I recognize him from the movie. Well, this is um, a 90s rocker looking character. He's got long black hair and round glasses, but he's wearing the, uh, the priest collar. And he seems to be a legit priest at first. And then he begins to gradually go crazy and say, we need to bring the sixties back. You yeah, he what tells else people he says? That, like he says a bunch of kind of anti-Christianity stuff. Like he says that religion and Christianity always bring up a bunch of uh, hazardous dietary things like abstinence, fasting, and solitude Mm -hmm. and that he talks about how religion is about sacrifice that's what he's he starts out with saying religion is about sacrifice you think okay this is going to be kind of normal then he just starts going crazy then he starts singing a song called jesus you scare the hell out of me (laughs) yeah and everybody joins in on this song or some people do he has backup singers very anti-religious movie there's a lot of this throughout yeah at least a few other moments in this and that kind of made me think of Boonwell. There's kind of a Boonwell absurdism around You're right. the realism there, in this movie. This movie does have a Boonwell feel to it, for sure. Hatred of authority, especially religious authority. Yeah, I but think I we can't find even the guy making... in the cast. It may be a man named Aaron Ellington as <laughs> Kyle. It seemed he looks like Glenn Danzig, but he seemed like a guy who was like a some kind of LA rocker of some sort, but I don't know. I got a musician vibe from him more than just his look, but also kind of his non-actory delivery made me think of someone like that. Yeah, there are a lot of notes I made here. Like, I don't know if we've gotten it there. When the Eagle Heart villain slaps the guy's wife. We should add, there, we, were, there were more green apples in this funeral scene. And, and the then pool. there's a the part where Roberts has voiceover from the from and the voiceovers from the next scene with his wife and it's like are we so is he supposed to be able to hear it i don't even know what that not that uh was about yeah i don't remember, and, I don't remember that around yeah, this oh yeah time, and that pre- and then this is there green apples everywhere and seeing the crazy priest i mean that note around and, this time in the caught, film caught up. when i was watching the movie right around this time in my life my girlfriend was on a phone call being extremely loud her parents have covid right now <laughs> and uh so That's she was great. on speakerphone call with her parents which was compounding the irritation of everything the the film and the phone call were married together in a nice pall of irritation that was falling upon me roy so it went together quite well but i remember there was there's a car chase that happens here with the wife oh yeah so after the funeral the hitmen are going to kill the wife Yes. And he tells, this is another thing where uh, maybe Roberts like talks to him and tries to get him to call it off. I can't remember, but uh, probably not. But at any rate, the hitmen, yeah, now they're on the road after the wife and she's got a gun and she realizes she's being chased and she takes them on a chase and they get lost in s- dust on the Canyon road, road trails and she splits off and they go the wrong way. Mm -hmm. and they lose her and this is where she ends up like stopped maybe out of gas or just like needing asylum and she runs into another model this time more of a frenchy model yeah she holds up a european lady with her gun who's oh yeah out on the dirt road you're right i I would like to add that her parent the covid that her parents have is not very 
it's it's not anything that's serious. And they I'd are like they are in the hospital and they're both on ventilators, but I think they're going to be okay. <laughs> You know, Angus McFadden, he wrote that Robert the Bruce movie that's like a sequel to Braveheart, you know. I was going to say, he plays Robert the Bruce in Braveheart. Yeah, and then in like 2019 or something like that, he ended up writing and making a Robert the Bruce movie. That's that's cool. He loved that role, man. It's kind of like uh, Cliff Robertson's Charlie 2 thing. Yeah, I love that. And speaking of Charlie's with unrequited projects, one time I met Charlie. Charlie Sheen Mm -hmm. and this was in his like post uh you know he already like had gone crazy and everything that everybody knew he'd gone crazy yeah and he just kept going on and on about how he was about to close a deal to make major league three (laughs) that's been like four years ago now and like he has this like handler guy kind of like the maid in this movie or the yeah the housekeeper lady in this movie that's like this dude that just he's his driver and kind of his valet and the guy's like don't don't bring up uh he thinks major league three is gonna happen but uh, it's like very clear major league three was never gonna happen you're like this guy's gonna play a pitcher he looks crazy yeah i remember that was like a big news story for a second major league three i thought so maybe he put it out there got it out there somehow but i don't think there was ever close to this major league three there was was a third major league film called major league back to the minors that's like probably like 20 years old now not starring sheen no with scott bacula oh yeah yeah it was a direct video is bacula wild thing I never watched it. Or just like a replacement character who's crazy. He's probably a new character. If anything, he's got to be like probably like the Tom Berenger character or something. Back in the story here, there's we talked about Garrett running the car off into the, into a ditch. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. They shoot yeah. at her. We already we already kind of covered that. She's so at this point, Caroline is chilling in, in some strange villa in the hills that feels more like she's in spain than in california at this point yeah and she's hanging out with uh this this french lady or spanish lady or something euro some, chick and then I think somebody the actress else. is greek yeah you're right she is she's pretty attractive yeah another another model but not blonde there's no a this lady's a brunette like the yeah. uh, venezuelan lady she has a mediterranean look about her more my style roy yeah Mine too. And so intercut with this was is Robert. He really liked that Greta Scotchy. Oh man, I tell you what, I'd like to uh I'd like to paint a Magritte portrait of her. And by that I mean cover up that dog face with a green apple. <laughs> <laughs> That's mean. Greta Scotchy's all right. Uh the intercut with this to add to to uh the villa estate kind of vibe and confusion as Robert's chilling at the Colbert's place where the bumbling hitmen show up. And they make a lot of apologies and we get a lot of talk about allergies, Brad Garrett's allergies. So the du- yeah, they kick up a lot of dust in that car chase because they're on those dirt roads up in the hills. Yeah. And he's apologizing because he suffers from these terrible allergies and he's from back east where there's none of this California ragweed and right. stuff. What do you think about Brad Garrett? You looked at uh, his uh, filmography. I'm not a fan. Yeah. I mean, I never really watched much of Everybody Loves Raymond. Me neither. Seems like he, he does he do a lot of voice acting? Probably. He has a crazy voice. He's in some commercials right now. He almost seems like he's like old timey, like he's from vaudeville or something. Yeah. Which makes sense because he played Jackie Gleason in a movie. Oh, uh, yeah. He's a huge guy. Yeah, he's a tall guy. Yeah, he's massive. Well, how about Ray Romano? Are you a Ray Romano fan? He seems all right. I don't know. Yeah. Same. Once again, no real opinion. Yeah, I'm pretty, uh, I run pretty lukewarm on Ray Romano. Same. Brad Garrett, I remember on what the Norm MacDonald has a show or not, no, Norm MacDonald video podcast or whatever it was called on the YouTube. He um, had ray romano on and ray romano is making fun of brad garrett because brad garrett's so like old and hideous and he oh has this God. like super gold diggery blonde bimbo wife <laughs> then one time in public actually more than one time i saw brad garrett and he was with that wife and i would always crack me up it seems like brad garrett would be he would work well in like woody allen movies maybe he's uh, been in some has he i don't know i don't know i do not know so during this 
part of the film, Caroline calls Roberts or vice versa. They are going to go meet each other at a bar. This is the period where R Roberts is wearing the Napoleon outfit. Oh, yeah, because what's his face? Um, McFadden. McFadden is Colbert. painting that painting, and yet yeah. the painting doesn't have the uh, Napoleon outfit in it. Oh, we've already skipped over the part where he talks to McFadden outside and McFadden is like the, the, the uh, housekeeper lady puts the machete to Roberts's throat while McFadden's talking to him. And then it turns out that Roberts has been asleep and wakes up and she's there behind him, but without the, the, the uh, machete. Mm -hmm. That was kind of some good cutting, actually. That was kind of something that when you talked about Buñuel, it popped in my mind, that scene. But that scene's kind of crazy because they have the part where they both finish these Perriers and, and chuck McFadden them. chucks his over his shoulder out into the canyon outside the house. And then Roberts does the same. And then the housekeeper lady goes and gets them. It's pretty funny. They don't break. They must have been plastic or something. They make a weird sound when they land, too. It sounded like the real sound. Hispanic Earth Mother taking care. So we're pretty well into the movie here. Have you seen Rain Phoenix again? No. All? You remember seeing her again? No. All right. Just confirming. So the hitmen are on their way to the bar, I guess. They're, they're on the road again. And this time they get stopped by some military guys who say they are looking for coyotes. Oh, shit. You know what? For this, and this will be a good transition too. You said, did Brad Garrett do a lot of voice acting? Do you remember a cartoon called Rock Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling? I sure do. When we were kids, he was the voice of Hulk Hogan on the show. Brad Garrett? Yeah. My mind is blown. <laughs> Pretty wild, huh? That's crazy. I, we'll have to find that on YouTube and watch that. Surely it's out <laughs> there somewhere <laughs> because I bet it, that's crazy, brother. <laughs> on brother you kind of see it now that you've when you said it i can imagine it now then Brad, um, the brad a maniac when they meet these soldiers did you recognize these guys or one of them roy how about you call the choppa podcast choppa maniacs no. yeah choppaholics is better yes it is so who, did i recognize some of these military guys yeah we meet two military guys their names are general schweinkopf <laughs> yes and <laughs> uh i guess the other guy's name was tom i think yeah and general schweinkopf which of course if we know is kind of a joke on schwarzkopf but also kind of a joke on schwarzenegger because it's played by sven ole thorson who does the whole part in an arnold schwarzenegger impression he's smoking a cigar but i believe that schwarzkopf well arnold would smoke the cigars yes but i'm now i'm trying to remember if schwarzkopf was a cigar dude at any rate we know Schwart Schwarzenegger was. Yeah, and he's definitely doing a Schwarzenegger voice. And do you know anything about Sven Ole Thorsen? I don't know. If I if I do, I'd need you to remind me. He is actually buddies with Arnold Schwarzenegger and has been in almost every Arnold movie up to a certain point, like through like collateral damage or something. He's in a bunch of the Arnold movies in some respect. But Makes sense. He's that's not what I immediately recognized him from. I immediately recognized him from a short-lived 80s children's program called Captain Power. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Captain Power? Not as much as I remember uh, rock and wrestling. Power on. Captain Power and the soldiers of the future. Earth 2147, the legacy of the metal wars, when man fought machine and machines won. Biodreads, monstrous creations that hunt down human survivors and digitize them. Volcania, center of the Biodread Empire, stronghold and fortress of Lord Dread, feared ruler of this new order. But from the fires of the Metal Wars arose a new breed of warrior, born and trained to bring down Lord Dread and his Biodread Empire. They were soldiers of the future. Mankind's last hope. Their leader, Captain Jonathan Powell, master of the incredible power suits which transform each soldier into a one-man attack force. Major Matthew Hawk Masterson, fighter in the sky. Lieutenant Michael Tank Ellis, ground assault unit. Sergeant Robert Scout Baker, espionage and communication. Captain Power was a show that was maybe on like USA and it was a kid's show and live action sold, 
it was live action and it was a sci-fi future dystopian future post-apocalyptic future set show about a guy named captain power and i think um, sven ole thorson was his buddy tank and this was a sh crazy show they sold these toys and I, my brother and I had at least one of these, if not, we each had one, I think, from Toys R Us, these guns. And the gun might also have been a replica of Captain Power's ship that just also had a trigger and a handle. I can't remember, but it was a gun. And the idea was the show was the first interactive children's show in that there would be spots on Captain Power's clothes and other people's clothes and little targets in the show. And you could shoot them with their toy gun and accumulate points through the show yeah this is ringing a bell now and i the, totally the thing, remember it now there was a home video version of it yeah you, you can shoot was, like duck hunt yeah there was a video and then there was an actual show too okay and yeah um, i remember it now and i remember he was tank but then i looked into the show a little bit and apparently the show was massively expensive and and not a hit and it was really com people complained about the violence but some people think the show was really good because it was like sophisticated for a children's show or something. I don't remember that. I don't remember liking the show that much, but really wanted to see it. And then it was like hard to remember when it was on. I think it might have come on while we were at church or something or right after. And you'd have to remember to tape it or something. I can't remember. But I do remember one thing that it is noted for is that that shooting the things didn't work at all. Mm -hmm. And that's worked... one, something I remember about it. We have a good friend. Her, her name is uh, Sharon Sharon. Sharon Dranicky oh. and uh, her brother had that Captain Power home video. And I remember being like, this is a ripoff. The gun doesn't work. Yeah, it really didn't work well. Hey, Roy, do you remember the Michael Jackson futuristic captain? What was it called? Captain EO. No, no. It was called Captain Pedo. <laughs> so captain power starred uh ole thorson mm -hmm. he was like the second he was the lead uh, character's buddy yeah i was looking at pictures of him uh, he does look familiar and is a little bit younger he was definitely a buff guy yeah i think he was a bodybuilding buddy of arnold's so he plays He's... schweinkopf and do you remember this conversation about the coyotes this is when you said this movie seemed like a slightly held over i was thinking like that after the Berlin Wall fell and the Soviet Union fell, that there was a lot of like, there are a lot of movies and reviewers and critics kept pointing out that movies about like the CIA or government or something are really hurting for a villain. Mm -hmm. And they mentioned that here, that they're out hunting coyotes in California because the uh, Cold War is over. Yeah, and Brad Garrett says a country at peace will attack itself. Yeah, and then Joe Federer really nice tells him that's smart. And he says, I wrote that. Domestic terrorism was our biggest problem in the 90s. True. Before 9-11. Then, But yeah, I was also thinking this is right before 9-11. And we've been talking a lot about 1990. We've been doing a lot of movies from 1999. Mm -hmm. But we have, we have we mentioned all of the real movies that came out in 1999 that Eric Roberts wasn't in? I don't know, but that was the, the movie year. You have Being John Malkovich, Three Kings, Eyes Wide Shut. Do you want to keep going? Yeah, very American memorable Beauty year. One best picture. There was Fight Club. There was The Sixth Sense, The Blair Witch Project. The new Star Wars movies started then. Any given Sunday, Summer of Sam. We're probably leaving tons out. But that was a. Did you say like, Fight Club? Yeah. Yeah. It was one of the most massive years for movies. Did The Matrix come out in 99 or 98? That was a 99er. That was uh, the big hit, I think, a little bit before Star Wars. I feel like Star yes, Wars Memorial Day weekend, 99. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And then Matrix was more of an April film, if I remember right. March, April. Yeah. I mean, we were working at a theater. Is it also the summer of Runaway Bride? We might have already brought up that movie. It was because I was looking at Julia's filmography. Actually, you know what? I think Runaway Bride was 97. And mm, the Julia was, movie from 99, if you'll was bear with the me. The one about the marrying one? Or the one about like, my best friend's wedding? No, you're right, Roy. Runaway Bride, 99. But I was also thinking of Notting Hill. Oh, yeah. From 99. And then the year before that was Stepmom, which I've never seen and never will. <laughs> and the movie Aaron Brockovich would come out in 2000. Isn't Stepmom the one where um, Susan Sarandon's dying? Yes. Did Soderbergh have a 99er? What year is Traffic from? 
Traffic that might be from 2000. 2000. Uh, then he probably did, but Roy, have you ever seen Schizopolis? Yeah, I think I saw it when we were roommates. See, I this movie really made me think of Schizopolis and Weekend. I've never seen Weekend. It's nice and irritating. The Limey was the Soderbergh 99. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Mm -hmm. With that Who song in there? In the trailer. It's the, not in the, the actual movie? No, not that I think. I don't think so. The movie, um, The oh, Limey is good, good, but the trailer for the movie, The Limey, is the best. Damn the man. song that is Watch in that, the movie, man. The Limey, is the um, song by the Hollies, uh, Jesus Was a Cross Maker. Mm, yeah which is all, probably the best one of the best parts of the limey two things I'll probably like to do on better YouTube. used in the movie elizabeth town directed by cameron crow <laughs> no wait you're right that's where they had jesus is a cross maker in the limey it's king midas with a curse king midas in reverse which is a holly song i think so unless it's not he's king midas in reverse which they play over a montage of finding out about peter fonda's character and two things i like to do on youtube is one i like to watch the trailer for the limey and another thing is i like to just watch like <laughs> the, a clip a sequence of the of the that part where they play the king midas in reverse song with the the, the thing about peter fonda office space came out in 99 that's a good uh, one how about election? my dad was looking at something with oh yeah election definitely came out in 99 how about my, the virgin suicides whoa i believe virgin suicides was more of like a one of those that was maybe out in europe or you know like it didn't really yeah come like out we in didn't America. really watch it in 99 watch it in 2000 it took a minute for that to get over here to us well, but sorry, what were you going to say? Was South Park bigger, longer, uncut from 19? Yeah, it was because it was that was out around the same time as Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah, and yeah. killed it at the box office. Boy, I love that Eyes Wide Shut movie, Roy. Yeah, that's probably my favorite. A lot of the movies we mentioned were pretty decent. Any Given Sunday is one of my faves. I think the best film of 1999 was Facade. Would have been Austin Powers 2. Oh gosh, I forgot about <laughs> that one. That was a big hit though. Massive hit. It has that good um, REM cover of Dragging the Line. Hey Roy, you have Bringing Out the Dead by Scorsese. You may have already seen yes, that. Yes, probably. And um, I did not. That's one of my faves. That was a flop. Roy, you got The Straight Story by David Lynch, 1999. Never seen it. It's good. Simple movie. Good movie. I think it's on Disney+. Plus. Of course, you got PTA's Magnolia. Oh yeah, that was a big movie. That was that kind. Of, that may have come out in the summer as well. Maybe not. Galaxy Quest. Oh yeah, that's a fun one. Uh, the Insider, Michael Mann. You, oh, that's a great movie. I forgot to mention that one. Yeah, that's one of the best for sure. And really, the best, Kevin Smith's Dogma. Oh gosh. That's a beloved movie, but not by me. Is it beloved? I think a lot of people really love Dogma. Yeah, that movie kind of ended the 90s. Yeah, killed, maybe so. the movie that killed the 90s, Dogma. Yeah, people really liked that. Well, let's run, let's speed run through the end of this movie because I'm kind of tired of talking about the story. Well, we're, not, we're um, pretty far in. We didn't yeah, mention that, that, um, that uh, he, when Roberts was wearing that Napoleon costume, which I forgot he wore, McFadden was painting that painting and it looked like roberts was posing for the painting but then he wasn't in the painting at all it was like a nude torso of a woman in a field yeah some joke of like the painting was, was nothing like what he was looking at yeah uh, roberts meets caroline at the bar yeah and the uh, soldier kind of, is at the bar tom right right he directs the hitman to towards her as she leaves and then he says yeah. to himself that he loves I, her it's really weird because he tells her to not go home to stay at his house that night right and then like she's gonna go pick up her stuff at the lay at the model's house this was really confusing to me because i thought he was telling her whatever she does to spend the night at his house that night like he's trying to save her from the hitman yeah girlfriend's phone conversation was really loud during this part this was really confusing because then yeah he must direct them to her because they somehow know she's at that other lady's house because they go to it but first the soldiers at the bar tom that was with Sven Ole Thorson, but wasn't Sven Ole Thorson. And he tells one of those girls about a dream he had. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this dream? The soldier? Yeah. No, because the, the phone conversation, Roy. Oh, I'm so surprised you didn't remember it. 
because the dream is he saw this Asian woman running on the beach who was pretty, but then they, we see the dream and it's like a, another, like, seems like a soft core porn yes. model or something. Lady, he was a like, soldier. So visually I did see this part. I just yes, didn't hear she's it. topless and she's running on the beach and she's like a lady covered Asian. in camo paint on her body. Yeah. But she's topless and her boobs are bouncing like, and she runs up to him. And then at the last second, when they're going to meet, she turns into a uh, spin only thorson and then that's, <laughs> that's the right. end of the that's the end of the dream and the end of the soldier's role in the movie he doesn't do or say he just tells that dream and there's no explanation for or he's just gone that's the end of him good riddance yeah and this is the then it plays out pretty much like you said she he directs the hitmen to uh that house but does only brad garrett go in joe vitarelli doesn't go in the house no just garrett goes in and there's a karate girl who's there who and i was trying to think is it, the, is it the same lady from the dream or not she didn't seem like i don't think it was the same lady well it definitely wasn't an asian lady but it wasn't fought okay. like an asian person oh, okay that's why I was martial confused. arts she kicks him in the chest and stabs her stiletto into his chest which kills brad garrett yeah, but it looks like it goes like a fifteenth of an inch into his chest. It hardly pierces him. It looks like it wouldn't even have gone through his bone. It looks kind of deep to me. Okay, my bad. You were you watch these movies closer than I do. Yeah, I didn't. It didn't look like it would kill him to me. You Not don't as have fast as it does. Some old bird blathering into the phone for hours in the background uh but yeah nah, brad nah. garrett dies and she's upset that her he ills she was and is, is in him yeah right around this time my girlfriend's parents were resuscitated on the other line and i think they're going to be dispatched discharged later tonight so everything's going to be fine covid will dispatch them caroline calls colbert at this point colbert and why does she call him i just have a note that she calls him on the phone basically saying like i know you're trying to kill me but i'm not dead yet i'm gonna come get you yeah she shows up at roberts's house this time she's wearing a like a crazy wig yes she's like maybe in hiding from the other hitman out there so she's worn this Pulp black pandora's thurman wig. yeah P pandora's box flapper wig and she holds robert's hostage she, he's he's tied up when the well, someone he tells her like either at the house at some point he tells her he'll tell her everything if she promises to love him forever and at some points in here we've had another part where he's talking to her somewhere and a plane flies over and makes the noise but you can still hear what they say and then there's another part where the plane flies over and makes the noise and you can't hear what they say again i just noticed it that one time i think it comes up three times and yeah. one time doesn't even do the gag which was confusing but anyway here he's gonna tell her everything that went on but she's already she she, she has a phone message that she's played for herself in his in his house where he's talking to colbert mm -hmm. which i don't know how like a phone where colbert's talking to him one about the murders so she knows he's in on it and she ties him up and gags him and she's gonna go meet colbert and leaves Roberts with a gun and tells him she'll leave, give him a chance to save himself. And he's all tied up with like a gun in his lap. Yes. And so this is when the orderlies come for the French guy. Yeah. We, we forgot to add, did, maybe we said this, I don't remember, that the orderlies came for that priest. Oh, yeah. The orderlies came for the priest. He was another escapee. Which would have been kind of a funny joke, but the way that that was paced was horrible. Like you see the orderlies for a long ass period of time before they even come and take the guy away. It would have been funnier if it was more of a surprise. Here's shot. a question. Like, was the nun at the funeral or no? She was. Okay. We'll bring that up in a minute. Also, at some point in here, when Colbert, Colbert was talking to Robert's on the phone, or maybe to the girl, to the wife, the housekeeper tells him his check bounced. Mm -hmm. But she checks, sticks around anyway, because here we have the, the wife Mexican and the housekeeper. Are, yeah, the house and the, the housekeeper, whatever, and the wife are together. And Angus McFadden's being chased around. He's wearing the Napoleon costume while he's being chased by the orderlies. It turns out he's another escapee. And on the wall is graffitied. There's like a wall behind the wife and the housekeeper, maybe a retaining wall that's part of that house. 
and it says l'état c'est la star or something like that it means i am the state it's a quote by louis the 14th so imagine he scrawled it on there and it turns out he's not french at all he's actually scottish and he dated a, a french girl who dumped him and he went crazy <laughs> and he reverts to his scottish accent in this scene too and does some speaking yeah. in yeah scottish. she says like his french is <clears throat> accent isn't that good yeah he runs up to the cult to the wife and she introduces herself as she's getting as he's getting his just desserts of being put away and she says uh who she is and he says oh Chante, and tries to take her hand then he tries to eat her hand they right drag him away yeah, that was crazy. I forgot about and, that. And the housekeeper says she was just starting to like him. Welcome back to the I Forgot About That podcast where Roy reminds me of things. Yeah, well, I literally just finished watching the movie again. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're pretty, now we're at the part where we go back to the house, to yeah, Robert's uh, house. Vitarelli Joe, shows up. Yeah. And there's maybe, a shootout. Maybe he unties Eric Roberts or Eric Roberts has untied himself. And it looks like they've worked out a deal where they're going to go kill the wife anyway. And, or yeah. And they're like, ah, this is all going to work out. Well, not for the ladies. <laughs> and then as soon as Joe Vitarelli starts to get up, Eric Roberts shoots him. Yeah. In the back, like his back yeah. is turned. He yeah. shoots at him. No, he misses. gets him, I think. Because well, then it seems like Joe Vitarelli's because... winged. I think he got him in the leg or something. Because okay. Joe Vitarelli starts like limping around. It's also confusing because, as we mentioned, there are no squibs or anything. There are only sound effects when the gun goes off. There's no, there are no blanks or anything. No muzzle flash. Like the, they just point guns at each other, and you mm. hear a bang. Minimal blood as well, like in the scene where she discovers the dead husband. Oh yeah, it's not gory. It's so this is a very absurd kind of thing too where they joe vitarelli chases eric roberts outside onto a tennis court and they both fire the gun at each other a bunch but there's no muzzle flash or blood or anything it's just like they just it's like two kids playing i'm a big i, th I think you're a big fan of this movie as well tokyo drifter is a movie i like a lot and oh yeah i forget the director's name seijun suzuki suzuki is kind of in this irreverent absurdist style at times yeah you're right does this it is, much much is... better but this shootout reminded me of something from that movie or yeah just crazy mm -hmm. another guy that i like a lot is beat takeshi mm. who really yeah, does like takes a lot of the ideas from a movie like this and just knows how to do it better like he knows how to pepper his movies. His movies are a little bit more Yakuza crimey, but he peppers them with absurdism and surrealism in a much smarter, more inspired way than this movie. But yeah, the shootout at the tennis court is very silly. Seems like they just kill each other. They, they kill fall, each other. Fall dead. At dusk on this kind of uh, <clears throat> not very beautiful, kind of grimy tennis court so now we see colbert back in the mental hospital yeah he's arriving and this is probably like the highest budget scene of the movie in a weird way yeah this weird it again looks like a house but it has cage bars in it yeah it has a big cage gate they bring him in and, and we, we, get a crowd we see of, the cop again yeah so i guess what we found out when they're chasing colbert is that it was a mass breakout from this mental hospital. We've seen them come after two different people, but it turns out lots of people were gone after. Yeah, which is a neat idea. And one of the people, we see a lot of people in here and they all greet him with applause when he arrives. Yeah, we see the rocker some, priest. Yeah, and we see the nun. Yes, which we didn't know. We did not know she was a mental hospital escapee and they did not go after her when they got the priest. That's what I wanted to bring up. Yeah, these are some very high-functioning mental hospital escapees in this movie. She she was not functioning high enough to cover her nipple totally no. with her costume in this scene, which might have been intentional, might have not. Now, did you think a lot about this? Because I did. Of whether uh, it was intentional? It, it feels very unintentional on her part, but, but they, like they just, had to uh, know. leave it in there. I wonder if it's in multiple shots too, like if, cause you know, I mean, maybe on this movie, they used to general lighting and set up, like did more setups. I feel like it's just awkward enough to where they knew about it, but she didn't. <laughs> That's very they possible. They found, found out later and post and were like, fuck it. 
Oh, I'm sure that they, if they found out later in post, they wouldn't have even bothered to go back. But yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. There's Certainly, some singing. Uh, There's like a musical moment here. She starts, he's, he's like quoting Napoleon or something. And I'm not sure. And then she uh, starts singing like La Marseille or something. I don't know. And then they, they make out. She and he make out. And that's the end of the movie, I think. The movie ends on a freeze frame of them making out. Plot keyword ends on freeze frame of making out. Can you think of any other movies that end that way? Probably a lot. Every movie that came out in 1999 ended that way, Roy. I know Fight Club did. Who's Who has the worst memory? Yeah, I know Fight Club. Fight Club did kind of end that way. Well, that's Facade from 99. Well, not one of, we, we didn't talk about how did you like Eric Roberts' performance in this movie? Well, he's trying to play... The whole movie is just very tongue-in-cheek. So you just don't give a shit about anybody in this movie. No, I think I thought he was pretty bad too, even within that. I didn't mm-hmm. think this was well, this was not his finest to me. He doesn't really do when he's consciously trying to be comedic. It's never really as strong when he's just Paul Schneider being in, intense and crazy. It's it comes off much better. There was a real acting class quality to some of like the high school drama or acting class quality to some of his acting in this movie. Yes, like in the and I always get the, that from yeah. Choppa. Yeah, since you brought Ch- him to was, my attention. Choppa was pretty wacky in this. How would you rate Rain Phoenix's big role in this? <laughs> out of 10 she never comes back no they were never never brought back or the um, she was never there bro the opening music with them is not the music really for the rest of the movie i don't think right but like that kind of uh yeah spaghetti westerny kind of music i don't know how far down you went into the cast but did you did you recognize mercedes rule in the film <laughs> Not in that beard. <laughs> yeah. So what's next? I think it's your choice. Okay. Well, let's see here. It's been fun hanging out in 99, and he was uh, in a few more from that year, but th- they might uh, be hard to track down. Well, you know, we could probably find Purgatory, at least, I'm sure. But uh, there was sure. something I uncovered looking at Eric Roberts' IMDb, and I was like, what? He was in this? And so I thought of that. Um, oh, yeah, I wanted to bring up that we i talked about how i don't find the wayans brothers charismatic i do think damon wayans is kind of charismatic in the last boy scout yeah i don't remember it's but then uh, it, was, it was on netflix it's on something else like one of the free streaming things now but i watched it on netflix a few months ago and was like yeah i re- still really like this movie it's a really crazy movie but anyway, I want to suggest something that we haven't done before we've done some tv movies and some long tv movies but I want to do. Please say touched by an angel. Please say touched by an angel. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that's okay. pretty fun to watch, actually. I want to watch a failed TV pilot that is on YouTube for a TV show of LA Confidential. Whoa. It's a 47 minute pilot, but I think on, on YouTube, you got to watch it with commercials, maybe because it's like an hour long. So what year is this? It's from 2002. What year is LA Confidential from? It's not a 1997. Yeah, it's a little bit before 99. Damn, good choice. This could be fun. Yeah, so we won't have to watch as long of a movie if it's bad. But yeah, I'm very curious to see how this turns out. I was like, when I saw it on the on his on his IMDb, I was like, what? Hey, Eric Roberts will be playing Pierce Patchett, <laughs> the David Strathairn role from the movie, and it stars Kiefer Sutherland as the Kevin Spacey role. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. And then two actors that I don't recognize as much as um, Ed Exley and Bud White. The uh, what's his face guy, guy pierce and geez russell, russell Crowe Crow. roles yeah melissa george as lynn bracken cool yeah um, so it's on youtube yeah it is on youtube so we can so if viewers want to see this they can and also what i like it is that we can really do a uh, bait and switch with the audience on youtube they can think that they're seeing a full-length version of uh, 1997's la confidential <laughs> yeah i like it i like pissing off the youtube users who think that they're watching free movies on youtube so one thing that that we can do with this or that i'm going to do is i'm going to read the novel la confidential between now and when we record or at least try to and this be your first elroy novel yeah i've never read an elroy novel i know we would uh, listen to that elroy boys podcast 
that mm-hmm. now is defunct apparently so if those guys are out there listening to this show at all like please note this did kind of help inspire this this will be my first foray into elroy but i went and looked for it i've been looking for the book everywhere and no one has a copy of it except it turns out the more public library where my mom got a copy for me for free today Aww. but i went to barnes and noble finally after not being able to find it at like half price books or anything in the barnes and noble fiction section i noticed a crazy thing like almost every book in it is by a woman welcome to the current year yeah like it's like there are almost no books in it by men and i just checked on looked here's one row of fiction novel authors pam jenoff paulette giles alexandra joel Julia Johnson, Sadiqa Johnson, Sarah Johnson, Karen Harper, Misplaced, Alka Josh, Lauren <laughs> Kate, Imogene Keeley, Susanna Kersley, Ellen Keith, manly last name, Julia Kelly, and Martha Kelly. That was a whole row. Yeah. I had read an article where a lot of a lot of those authors might be men, Roy. Oh, really? Uh, a lot of men are ghostwriting. Or not ghostwriting, but they're using female pen names. Well, I read something years ago that most readers are kind of like our women, a mm-hmm. lot of middle-aged women. Yeah, so kind they of feel more comfortable reading, reading uh, material written by someone of their gender. Which I read books by women, but once, but it's like one in every like 20 books I read is by a woman. So I really can't uh, fault them. My favorite male writer is Virginia Woolf. George Eliot, I read this year. Georgia? A George Eliot book. Yeah. I forget what her name really is, but she did the opposite, which is weird to me. Like she was, uh, you know, she went by uh, George Sand, I believe also was a woman. But George Eliot, uh, she's post Jane Austen and stuff. So definitely there were famous lady authors, but she, she took a man name. I think I remember her being mentioned by Old Bloom. I think he was a fan of hers. The one I read was pretty good. It was Adam Bede was the name of the novel. Oh yes, uh, Middle March was a was a bloom bloom that he liked quite a bit. Oh. And I remember uh, this. That's where I learned that George Eliot was a lady. Yeah, not a guy. Yeah, Adam Bede was pretty good. The plot of the book wasn't the greatest. You could kind of see where it was going early, but well, some of it it was very kind of Victoriany. But just the writing and little observations and the way it dealt with people and stuff, it was really good. I would definitely read another book by her. Cool. I just finished reading. I never read a Nick Hornby novel. Uh huh. I found one laying around from when my sister lived here called A Long Way Down about four people that are going to commit suicide New Year's Eve and they meet by chance or just by coincidence, but they're all committing suicide. And then they kind of like hang out, don't commit suicide. Whoa. Have you ever read any Nick Hornby? I have read High Fidelity and yeah, I this, enjoyed it a lot. And yeah, it, this book was pretty decent. I feel like I'm at in my life now where the character in High Fidelity was and he's like only 30. <laughs> so it makes me sad when I think about High Fidelity. Yeah, I mean, in this book, uh, I there's a musician guy in this book, one of the guys that's committed suicide. It occurred to me that I was looking at the list of the titles of uh, books by Nick Hornby. They all sound like they could be albums. Yeah, that's good insight. Fever Pitch about a boy <laughs> high fidelity forgot he wrote a long fever way pitch. down is about the a boy is the, is the title of a nirvana song oh really <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and there's a lot of music talk in this book about bands and lyrics and stuff well we should wrap it up roy my bladder is getting ready to burst but mine too it's been a, it's been a good chat it feels good to be back yeah we got a wacky one next time la confidential oh we didn't bring up one thing we said last time we were going to hang out and maybe watch a uh, Eric Roberts movie. We did not watch an Eric Roberts movie. Do you want to pee and then talk about the movie we did watch? We can just talk about it now. Okay. What, what movie did we go? We went to the theater and saw a movie. Yeah, that's right. We went and watched The Batman. Which is now on HBO. How'd you, how did we like The Batman? I think we both agreed it was very long. Yeah, too long. For, for that kind of movie. But it was cool, and I enjoyed it more than the Christopher Nolan movies. Yeah, I think we're on the same page there. I give a thumbs up to the Batman with reservations that it is way too long. Yeah, definitely it looked cool. Didn't look like 2022 cheap filmmaking. No, it was cool. I liked it. 
Yeah. I've been watching some of it on um, HBO late at night, little tiny installments before I get ready for bed. And it's pretty visually dense. There are little things I didn't notice the first time. I've been enjoying looking at it before again. I knew nothing about it going into it except for just a few things. And so I had no idea Colin Farrell was the penguin. And so it was fun during the movie leaning over to you and saying, who is that guy? And you're like, it's Colin Farrell. Yeah, it's you, like, you really can't tell. Yeah, even when you know, like, it's like he, he's not talking like Colin Farrell either. No, he totally disappears. We also made a movie. That's right, which you can watch on YouTube. That's right. It's great. It's shorter than the Batman. Yes. <laughs> okay, Roy, I look forward to doing this again soon. Huzzah. Huzzah. You told me to get down, so I'm getting down. I said get down, not get down. Why didn't you say so? Next. Okay, Andre, your turn. Gee. I didn't mean to break your scale. I can't weigh you. The scales don't go that high. Relax, Daddy. I'll handle this. All right, Andre. One foot on each scale. 248 plus 248. That's 496 pounds. 345 pounds. You're overweight for your height, Captain Lou. You've got to lose 40 pounds in the next 10 days. Or you're out. Out? Out of wrestling? Don't worry, Captain Lou. It's only four pounds a day. Yeah, all you have to do is eat five cheeseburgers for breakfast instead of ten. 